So we've got two readings this morning. The first is Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 13. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And the second reading is Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello. Good morning. Uh, before the service, when we were praying, um, an image came to mind of ice. It was probably because I'm flipping freezing. And um, uh, I, it struck me as thinking about ice, that ice can be, ice takes loads of different forms. Ice can be like a very massive, slow-moving glacier. It can be an iceberg floating in the sea. It can be stuff we scrape off our car window screens. It can be stuff we put in our drinks in the summer to keep us cool. And it, I just wanted to start by saying that because I think what... Um, Ice can be different things in different situations. So my prayer this morning is that this, this, these passages, the word of God, will speak to us where we're at for what we need it to be. So it won't be everyone's glacier. It won't be everyone's uh, ice cube in a glass. But it'll be what the Holy Spirit wants to do for you this morning. So let's pray about that and then I'll begin. Father, I thank you so much for the Bible. What an amazing book and what an amazing gift it is to us. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that as we look at it together, you would be, the word would be what it needs to be for every individual person here this morning. That you'd speak to us collectively, but you'd also be what, what it needs to be for every individual member of, of our community this morning, whether they're watching at home or whether they're here with us now. So Holy Spirit, we invite you to do your work in our hearts and minds this morning. Amen. Amen. So... Um, what we have here is, uh, we have two passages. One is a true story. It's a story that actually happened. It's something that Jesus actually did. And we also have a parable. A parable is not a true story, although it contains truth. It is a thought that Jesus offered. It is teaching that Jesus offered. And what is brilliant about these two passages is that although they didn't come chronologically next to each other in, in the story of Jesus, 
the parable in Luke 18 is almost like Jesus' own commentary on the true story that he enacted in Matthew 9. It's almost like he's given us teaching on something that he's actually done. So it was very easy, really, to preach on because we have this amazing interpretation of his own action. Before we um, crack on and, and look at the story in more detail, I just want to make one simple point about Pharisees and tax collectors. And this is important because we're talking about grace this morning. And it's really important to remember that the problem with, with this story and all of the Bible is that we read it with the hindsight of 2,000 years of church history and church teaching. And if you were a kid at Sunday school or kids' church, uh, you would have been taught. So you're viewing this story with the hindsight of what you learned at kids' church when you were a kid or at school when you were a kid or whatever, or 30 years of being in church or whatever. And hindsight has created for us, has given us this sense that it's a bit like a pantomime. Pharisees are bad. Boo. Ta ta thank you. Tax collectors, that's very good, thank you. Tax collectors who turn to Jesus are the goodies. So we have the Pharisees. Yes, and we have the tax collectors. Oh, no, we don't. And um, the, the fact is, actually, what's really, really important is we need to, to, to take out that hindsight that we have. And we need to really realize that actually to the people that read Matthew's gospel and heard this true story, and the people that read Luke's gospel and heard Jesus' teaching did, really didn't have that boo, hiss, yeah, idea of it. For them, the Pharisees really were the people that were trying hardest. They really were the people that were seen as righteous, who were living in a way which was God-honoring. And the tax collectors really were the lowest of the low. They really were the most disgusting, sinful people that there were. And so we need to have that in mind as we look at each of those in turn. This, these two stories are actually about the heart, the heart of the Pharisee and the heart of the tax collector and how Jesus reacts to those hearts. So when we've looked at the two in, in turn, what I'd like us to do is, is examine our own hearts briefly at the end. And I'm going to ask you the question, where is your heart in comparison to the tax collector and the Pharisee? Let's look at the tax collectors first. Matthew 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Now, as I'm sure you've heard many times, if you heard this preached on before, tax collectors... Because they worked for the occupying Roman army, they were seen as traitors. And because they worked for them collecting taxes and also took a hefty sum for themselves, they were seen as thieves and traitors. They were seen as the lowest of the low. They had a bad reputation. They were hated by the people. They were viewed as sinful and they were known as associates or friends of sinners. And this particular tax collector was called Matthew. Now, uh, in the other Gospels, this same story, he's called Levi. And uh, we don't quite know why. There's two names for him. But one possible explanation, and I think this is quite helpful for when we're thinking about this, is that he could have been Matthew the Levite. Now, this is important because if he was a Levite, he'd probably been brought up in the Levite tradition, and he would have known what God's best way of living was to be. And he would have known as he sat in his tax collector's booth, he would have known if he was a Levite that how he was behaving was contrary to God's laws and God's ways for his life. If, if that's why he was called Levi. Anyway, what happens is this guy, Matthew, he probably had witnessed Jesus' ministry He'd probably heard Jesus' preaching. He'd probably seen Jesus' miracles, maybe his healings, as Jesus had gone through about his ministry. But it's incredible to Matthew, and it's incredible to the readers of the time, that Jesus, who was viewed as a rabbi, who was a rabbi, a respected teacher, would go up to such a man as Matthew and say, Matthew, follow me. And it's even more incredible in some ways that Matthew immediately got out of his tax booth and obeyed that authority. Perhaps because he'd seen Jesus doing amazing things, perhaps he was intrigued. But there's something about Jesus' authority. 
Matthew, follow me. And immediately he gets up. He leaves the tax booth behind and he follows Jesus. This new life that he begins, this new direction, is worthy of a great celebration. So he has a fantastic dinner party. And we read this in, in verse 10. Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house. And he wants to invite his friends. But unfortunately, Matthew, being a tax collector and a sinner, only has friends who are also tax collectors and sinners. So it's quite a motley crew there at Matthew's house. Sinners was a phrase describing anyone who failed to keep God's law, but particularly those that didn't live to the standards set by those such as the Pharisees. Now let's turn to Jesus' parable in, in Luke 18. So he begins his parable by saying, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And we read in verse 13 that the tax collector stands at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Because of his shame and because of this sense of distance from God, he stands apart. He beats his breast as a sign that he is sorrowful and regretful for what he's done and his situation. He asks God for mercy. What's interesting here is he doesn't say God, he doesn't plead his case. He doesn't justify himself. He doesn't list the things that he does. He doesn't say, I know I'm a bad tax collector, but I actually did these three or four good things. He has no evidence to, to promote himself. He just knows that he is rubbish. He knows that he is a failure. He can only rely on God's mercy. That's all he can do. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So that's the tax collector. Now let's talk about the Pharisees. Pharisees were, um, they weren't a priestly order. They were a lay person's order. And they were very popular amongst the people at the time. And they adhered to buy the biblical laws as found in the law of Moses. But they also adhered to extra biblical laws, things which were outside of that. And they came up with their own laws of purity and religion. And they rigorously obeyed these laws, these strict rules. They were known as the separate ones because they felt that the way they were asked to live and, and the way that they were was separate from the other people who weren't quite like them. They were known as the separate ones. And so they are rightly offended by Jesus going to the house of Matthew with his tax collector friends and his sinful friends. And so they go to Jesus' disciples. Interestingly, they don't go to Jesus himself. They're obviously a little bit nervous, but they go to his disciples and say, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners, verse 11? It's not really a question. It's more an accusation. It's a charge against Jesus. Why does your teacher spend time with these sinful people? You see, the Pharisees couldn't see anything positive about what had happened to Matthew, the tax collector. They couldn't see that Matthew had been pulled up out of his tax collecting booth and brought into a better place. They couldn't see that. All they could see was that Jesus was eating with sinners and tax collectors. They would rather judge Jesus than celebrate what Jesus had just done. The Pharisees had confidence in their own righteousness and they looked down on everybody else who wasn't like them. And that's exactly how Jesus starts his parable in Luke. Luke 18 verse 9, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. So he talks about the Pharisee at prayer, thinking they're successful. And it reads this, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people or even like this tax collector. He stands by himself, that highlighting his sense of separateness, that idea that we're going to separate ourselves off. I'm not going to pray with the normal people. I'm going to pray by myself. And in the original language, he uses the word I five times. This is all about him. This is so egocentric. He says, 
I thank you that I am not like these other people. He's almost turning into a competition. I thank you that I am winning this competition. I fast twice a week, which wasn't in the law. It wasn't required by the law. I give a tenth of all I get, which actually the fullness of that was also not in the law. But he's bragging about his own moral purity, his own religious and spiritual piety. It's almost as if he's entering into a contract with God. He's saying, God, let me list for you the things that I do for you. Let me list the things that I'm doing well. I do this, I do that, I do this, I do that, I'm winning. Now, God, what are you going to do for me because I'm doing these things? And it's almost like the contract. God, you are now going to make me righteous. You're going to make me right with you. You're going to justify me. You're going to forgive me because I am doing all these things. Such a contrast from the attitude of the tax collector. So, how does Jesus react to these different people, these different attitudes. Well, first of all, it's worth saying that he's clearly comfortable in the house of tax collectors and sinners because he went there to eat dinner with them. He's clearly at ease with the people who have messed up. Isn't that comforting? And he says some of the most profound teaching that we have in the Bible in, 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 in his response. First of all, he says this, it is not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick, verse 12. It is not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. You see, Jesus is saying that only those who know they're ill go to the doctor, obviously. If you don't know you're ill, you don't go to the doctor. But of course, everyone's spiritually ill. There are no spiritually healthy, fully healthy people. Romans 3, verse 10. There is no one righteous, not even one. See, the Pharisees viewed themselves as healthy because of their observance to the law, but they were actually blind to the truth. The truth is they were spiritually sick as the tax collectors and sinners, but they were blind to that truth. And one of the roots of their spiritual sickness was their tendency to judge other people, as we've seen. Jesus taught in Matthew 7, Do not judge, or you will be judged. You see, the Pharisees expected a Messiah, which is what Jesus was claiming to be. The Pharisees expected a Messiah who wouldn't come and pull Matthew out of the tax booth, but who would go and destroy Matthew in the tax booth, would crush him, would kill him off, would defeat him. They wanted judgment on people like Matthew, who were traitors and sinners, But Jesus comes along and says, no, my way is not that. I'm going to rescue him from his tax booth. I'm going to rescue him and bring him to be with me and welcome him to sit and eat with me. And the Pharisees just couldn't handle that. They couldn't accept that. They wouldn't accept a Messiah who would transform a sinner. But that's exactly what Jesus came to do. Remember what we heard at Christmas with Mary. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will crush the sinners. You are to give him the name Jesus because you are going to destroy people like Matthew. No, you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save people from the tax booth. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save people from their sin. second amazing bit of teaching Jesus offers he says go and learn what this means I desire mercy not sacrifice now this is interesting this phrase go and learn I was interested to find out that it's an old uh, it's an old phrase that the rabbis would use apparently and it's slightly patronizing it's like when you've not done your homework well enough and they say go home and do it again it's basically saying that go and learn what this means you've read it because they would have read it in Hosea 6. That's where that quote comes from. But Jesus is saying, you haven't really understood it. You've read it, but you haven't understood it. Go back. Go back to the text. Go back and read this again. Think about it more. You haven't got this. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. 
Mercy is a word uh, from the original Hebrew hesed, which means steadfast love, which was a covenant love. You know what I was saying about how the Pharisees had almost created a contract with God. I do these five things and you will sort me out. But that's not the kind of contract God is interested in. God is interested in a covenant. He's interested in a covenant of love with his people, of mutual love and therefore mercy. The, for the final bit of wisdom from Jesus, we turn back to the parable. Verse 14. All those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. All those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. The tax collector is made fully alive. The tax collector is justified before God. The tax collector is made righteous before God. He's given righteousness. He's credited to him. Not his own righteousness. He had no righteousness of, him, of his own that he could hold on to. But he was given righteousness because of the humility of his heart. I love the fact, and this is encouraging for, for anyone that needs to hear this, it happens immediately. In that moment, instantly, the tax collector goes home forgiven, made righteous. When you walk out of here in 20 minutes' time, whatever it is, if you've accepted Jesus' mercy in your life, you walk home forgiven. I mean, how many times do we come to church and walk home still feeling guilty? I don't think we should. I think we should walk home celebrating our forgiveness and we should have a party and invite all our sinful tax collecting friends around and tell them what God has done for us. Every week. It's a lot of cooking. You don't think so? Don't think so, Mark. No, fair, fair point. I don't really think so either. Sometimes I say things from the front that I don't really think about. Where was I? <laughs> one, one quote I read this week said, this is a shocking reversal of common expectation. A shocking reversal of common expectation. The Pharisee thought he was righteous tried to justify himself. The tax collector knew he wasn't righteous. All he could depend on was God's mercy. And as a result, he was pronounced by God justified. So just in closing, like I said at the beginning, I want you to open your heart to the Holy Spirit and think about where you are in this story. Who do you most relate to? Who do you most relate to? There's something that I only saw this morning as it was being read at the 8.45 that I hadn't registered as I'd looked at it beforehand. I don't know if you picked up on this. Both the Pharisee and the tax collector, when they went to pray, what does it say about where they stood? Anyone pick that up? Apart. apart. They both stood apart. Isn't that interesting? But the Pharisee stood apart out of pride because he didn't want to associate with anyone else. He stood apart because he was too proud. He was too proud of who he was to get near to anyone else. The tax collector also stands apart, but not out of pride. He stands apart out of shame because he's too embarrassed to stand near other people. So my simple question for you this morning is, where's your heart? Is your heart proud or is your heart humble? And let's be honest, we're going to be a mixture. We're going to be a mixture, aren't we? We have bits of us which are proud and bits of us which are humble. But, but that's the challenge for this, this, these two passages. Where's your heart? Is it, are you at a distance because you're proud or are you at a distance because you are humble? Let's talk about the Pharisees first of all. Now, of course, none of you are going to say, yes, I'm like a Pharisee. But I think sometimes the Holy Spirit can convict us and say, actually, we are being pharisaical. Sometimes we need trusted friends to point out to us where we're being pharisaical. Sometimes we need uh, the people who walk the journey with us to point out where we're actually being judgmental or proud like a Pharisee. But if, if maybe... 
just, I just want to challenge you with a couple of things. Number one, how relaxed are you with sinners and outsiders and tax collectors? Not real tax collectors, but none of us are comfortable with them. But how relaxed, how relaxed are you with sinners? You know, Jesus, is, is, Jesus is, is happy to just to go to dinner with them and hang out with them. How relaxed are you really hanging out with sinners? That doesn't mean you agree with their actions. It just, Jesus never sinned, but he was very comfortable in their, in their company. I think that says something about Jesus' self-confidence, actually, in his own identity. But how comfortable are you? And equally, if you're really honest, are you ever in danger of being confident of your own righteousness? Do you ever look down on other people? God, I thank you. I am not like other people. And if I'm really honest, I do that. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. And do you know one of the reasons I think we do that is because we feel bad about the things that we do. And so if we see someone else that's done something worse, it makes us feel a lot better about what we do. Isn't that true? I mean, maybe that's just me. And maybe you're all much more um, sorted than that. But for me, I think that's an attitude I have. When I hear about someone else's mistake or sin, there's a little bit of pride that goes in me. And I go, oh, thank goodness I'm not that bad. And that is what the Pharisee is doing, and that's what I do. So I have a Pharisaical attitude sometimes. It makes me feel better about myself. That's the negative. Let's talk about the tax collector just as I finish two of these. So maybe there's two angles that you might be this morning on the tax collector. This is the first one. And I wonder if this speaks to some of you. Are you still sat in your tax booth. And I don't mean, have you never heard, well, it might be that one or two people who have never heard Jesus' call to follow him and, 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 and would love to make that happen for you and would love to talk to you afterwards. But I'm talking generally, I think, about those of us who've already chosen to follow Jesus, but somehow we still sit in our tax booth. And you, and you will know what your metaphorical tax booth is. You, you will know what that is for you. What is the thing in your life that on, even on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, you know it's not God's way, it's not God's best for you, and you know Jesus is outside your tax booth coming, come on, don't, don't stay there today. Let's go find a better way together. But somehow, maybe on a weekly basis you, or repetitively, you end up actually staying in your, in your booth because that's the place of comfort. You build the walls around you. That's where you get rich. That's where humanly you thrive. And God says, come on. Come on, Mark. Get out of your tax booth. Follow me to a better way. And I wonder if there's anyone here who is still stuck in a tax booth. Whatever that is for you. It's time to respond to Jesus' call. Because if you do that now, in 20 minutes when you walk out of here, you walk out free of the tax booth. And then sometimes I think on a Tuesday morning we go back in the tax booth, whatever that is for you, don't we? And we come to church next Sunday and we realise we've sat in our tax booth all week. That's the first one. The second one from the tax collectors is this. I wonder if you are like that tax collector who backed away from everybody else because, because you were t- you're too ashamed of who you are. And you don't want to be with other people because you're embarrassed about who you are and you're so aware of your rubbishness and your mess that you, you're just ashamed and you beat your breast and you don't look up and you, you're just burdened by this. And you plead, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And if that's you this morning, I just want to say to you, maybe it's time for you to hold the truth for yourselves this morning that those who humble themselves will be exalted. And you too can go home today justified, made righteous before God. Because that's what Jesus has come to do for you. I'd be saddened if there's anyone here who is happy being a Pharisee. I'm sad 
by the fact that some, and myself that is, as I've express, expressed, I'm saddened by people who keep going back to their tax booth. But I'm really sad if anyone here this morning doesn't walk out of here free. Because it's so easy. Humble yourselves and you will be exalted. God, have mercy on me, a sinner, and God commands righteousness on you. He forgives you. He heals you. You are ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. And I want everyone to go home feeling that truth, knowing that truth, believing that truth, celebrating that truth this morning. Let's stand together. I'm going to pray. Father, I just pray you'd send your Holy Spirit on us. And I've said lots of words. So, Lord, now we need your Holy Spirit to come and, 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 and seal that and impress that on our thinking and our feeling and, and make it real for us. We pray, come, Holy Spirit. Where we have the attitude of a Pharisee, would you free us and we're sorry? Come, Holy Spirit. And where we're still stuck in our metaphorical tax booths, Father, we thank you that you call us out and you call us out to follow you. Come, Holy Spirit, give us obedient hearts. Give us the courage to step away from those things that aren't right, that trap us, that keep us sat down in a bad place. Give us the courage to hear your voice saying, follow me. Give us the courage to take your hand and be led away from that on a daily basis, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. And Father, where we're feeling unworthy, where we're feeling like we are just a sinner, where we are feeling ashamed, where we're feeling embarrassed, where we're feeling like we're rubbish. Holy Spirit, pour the love of the Father into our hearts that we would know that we are ransomed, we are healed, we are restored, we are forgiven, and we go free. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us. We love you, Jesus. Thank you.